In this edition of Detroit Performs, the art of brewing exudes pride in Detroit. One of our slogans is, is we, we're bringing Detroit everywhere. And uh, it's showing, and uh, the Detroit name does very well. You know, we're gritty, we're resourceful, we're blue collar, we're hard workers, we like to have a great time. So it's, it's very rewarding. A college student helps to beautify Detroit's Brightmore neighborhood. I made a piece that not only I can be proud of as an artist, as a person, on a personal level, but also that the community can be proud of. Credit Card Detroit shares with us another citizen review. Magenta Giraffe is providing a place for playwrights to hear their work and audiences to provide feedback. And it's great for the playwrights, it's great for the actors, it's great for the community. So I'm really glad that they are offering this. A letterpress studio mixes their love of food with their printing events. In addition to producing work on the letterpress, the space serves as a gallery. It's a creative and intellectual hub uh, within the city, and I feel it really, it really fills a void. And a chef reveals the fine art of making sushi. Food is, is in the forefront of the performance, but it's also relative to how it translates from the server and from the sushi chefs, and just how it's all integrated, and the juxtaposition of the dishes. It's all ahead on today's episode of Detroit Performs. Major funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the McGregor Fund. Additional funding is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Detroit Performs, everybody. I am your host, DJ Oliver, and we are back at Detroit's Eastern Market. In the heart of Eastern Market is a six block public market that has been feeding Detroit since 1891. Our first segment features a Detroit brewery, which shows how creating something people really enjoy is not only an art, but produces an immense amount of Detroit pride. Art and beer is individual, and that's why there's so many breweries in the, in the state of Michigan, over 110, and, and customers love that too. So each individual brewery has their own story, you know, has their own beers that they make, and uh, that, that's the true art of it, because there isn't one beer that's alike. It's something that people will go out of their way to purchase or to try. Breweries have become um, destinations, travel destinations for people. People will go out of their way to find beer at the source. Yeah, I would compare brewing kind of like being a chef where you have all these different ingredients available and you want to find the right combination to make a beer just the way you want it. And then it's also very rewarding when you make a beer that you like and you find out all these other people like it too. No one started with 100 barrel tanks like, like, like places are moving into now. It all started very small and very, um, again, hands-on is, uh, is the best way to describe it. So you've got your uh, palette of ingredients and you've got your equipment and you're blending it together in, in a unique way to create a unique product. I think it's what separates craft beers from like the huge mega brewers is the fact that the, the mega brewers are just making, you know, very light, plain beer that, you know, appeals to just about anyone. Like, you, it's hard to dislike one of those big beers because there's not a whole lot of flavor to it. And people who like craft beer are looking for something more. So we have different types of grain that we use that make it darker or roastier, uh, we have different hops, we can add a whole lot of hops, make it hoppier. Um, you're more and more getting into like sour beers, like Belgian style beers that are made in the US. So all these different things that have very distinct flavors that aren't for everyone, uh, but they're more of like a, a gourmet product really. 
we could easily uh, just make vanilla java porter and dirty blonde and, and do nothing else and probably still sometimes struggle with meeting the demand. But as you, you like, everybody likes, as, as an artist and, as, and in that realm, you always like to spread your wings a little bit a little bit and just and see what else you can do you want to you want to test your own limits test your the limits of your equipment and it allows us to have a little bit of fun get all these different ingredients you can mix together in different combinations give you different results and you can just play with things from there and alter things you know you can come up with a, a simple beer and then come up with variations of that beer I mean it's you know it's endless how far you can go with it dozens of types of grains and hops and processes you can use and uh, different strains of yeast and you have to learn them all and figure out which which of these will give you the flavor that you're looking for so that you can come up with a creation really what is what it is that's unique to your brewery. We really kind of cover all the bases. We have approximately 30 approximately 30 different labels that we produce, whether it be all year round, occasional single batch production or seasonal, uh, seasonal production. It's nice to make something that people appreciate and people really enjoy. Like when people really like one of our beers, they become big fans of it. It's not just something that's convenient or cheap or they're buying it because they really like it. And we're still doing things where we grab the 50 pound bag of malted barley and we're putting it into the mill to grind it and you know it takes at least 17 of those to make a batch sometimes more uh, and we're throwing in the hops right into the pot just you know just by hand everything's kind of by hand so uh, it's different than like I've done tours of some of the huger breweries in this country and you hardly see any people there you mean you might see as many people in one of those as you see in one of these small breweries uh, because everything's automated here you know everything's kind of done by hand even the bottling part of it it's loaded and unloaded by hand and i think that's the big difference i think there's lately a lot of pride in detroit in the city that's taken a beating over the last few years but everyone i think is starting to stand up and say this really is a great city a great old town and it really gives you, I think it means a lot to people throughout the Detroit area and throughout the state that this is made right in the city of Detroit. One of our slogans is, is we, we're bringing Detroit everywhere and uh, it's showing and uh, the Detroit name does very well. You know, we're gritty, we're resourceful, we're blue collar, we're hard workers, we like to have a great time. So it's, it's very rewarding. I like it when I sit down at the bar at the end of the day or take home a bottle and I, like we just had our blueberry cobbler beer and I took one gulp of that and I knew it was just right on. It was just like dessert in a bottle. So it's always a satisfying thing. You know, I guess I suppose it's true for whatever you do. If you're working on something and you complete it and you know it's good, it makes you feel good. This is more than just a homebrew. This is something that you can go to any store and people talk to me about beers. People all around Detroit have heard of it and tell me they love the beers and it feels good to, to say yeah I made that. We know we've gotten it right when, uh, when we need to make more <laughs> and we can't make enough. To learn more about Atwater Brewery head to DetroitReforms.org. College for Creative Studies student Elijah Dillard and his peers came together to paint a mural in Detroit's Brightmore neighborhood. Each illustration of the mural symbolizes a different aspect of community. Let's take a look. My name is Elijah Dillard. I'm 19 and I live in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Well, this summer I'm working for College of Creative Studies with a group of 10 other young people on a mural for the Brightmore community. We're designing the, the mural. We're bringing together all the ideas from the, us 11 students and Joy will face putting it all together. Then we'll take that, enlarge it, put it on the wall, and paint it. I'm excited to be a part of this project because I feel like I'm giving back to the city because this is where I was born and raised. Though my parents moved out of the city, I still come back here, I still actually live here with a friend. I feel like I'm putting something back in from a city that's given me a lot. 
This seminar, I hope to learn to work with people from different backgrounds and with different experiences. Every group has something new to teach you. Every group has something new to offer you as an artist because they come with new ideas, they come with new experiences. We've finalized the concept, we've got paint, and we've moved out here and we've enlarged the concept to the big wall. We split the crews into two, so one will come in the back and do the alley, and we'll go in the front and do the face. Well, there are a multitude of ways to go from the concept to the final piece. Some artists like to pounce, which is perforate, a paper, perforate paper, put it on top of it, and then um, hit it with a chalk bag, basically, and it gives us a faint line that we can then color in and then go from there. Some artists like to project it, if, you have, if we can come in at night, but this time we actually freehanded it. We're kind of adding a lot of symbolism in there that a lot of people can connect to. The hands bring out work that the community puts in and the kind of togetherness that you need to make a community and to make a city, basically. The tree is family. You have your roots, but you also have where you're going, towards the sky and up and onward. Being able to work with uh, Joy O'Fay is a really unique part of my summer this job. This way, yeah. and you pull it down, and then you run the blue over it, the reflection will come by itself. Artists with like really clean and sharp, precise skill, it's someone that you can look up to and then you can grow next to him. So Joy's been present through the whole process. He never has fallen back, basically. He's always been upfront, and his teaching style isn't necessarily like a, a classroom teaching style. He's more hands-on. He'll wait till you're like making the mistake before he swoops in and helps out. Having a working artist on the job is like invaluable because you see the skill. Art is very subjective, so people see it as this is good, this is bad, this is good, this is bad. But if you have an artist with like really clean and sharp, precise skill, it's someone that you can look up to and that you can take from. And if, it's because he's working right next to you, you can see what he's doing and kind of incorporate what you're doing. So thus far, I've learned to be more patient with the people I'm working with. A less stressful environment fosters creativity. I've learned from my supervisors to be more accountable, to be more responsible for not only myself, but the project as a whole, because you take pride in what you do. The community loves it. Um, the community drives by, gives honks. Some people stop by and ask how they can get involved. And everybody is like, really supportive, I mean, from all ages, no matter who they are. People stop, look at it, come talk to us about it. And I think it's, it's really great that the community is getting involved, or wants to get involved, and wants to see this happen in their community. And we have a lot of people coming up and asking about the piece. We have a lot of people, a lot of people coming up and trying to get involved, because it's there, because they can see it, because it's tangible. And I think that's really important for the community. At the beginning of the summer, I wanted to make a piece that I could f come back to and be proud of. But now, I feel like I've not only done that, but I've also incorporated the community into the piece. I made a piece that not only I can be proud of as an artist, as a pers on a personal level, but also that the community can be proud of. I believe art is a language. I believe art has things to say to everyone. Public art projects do have the power to affect communities. It does have the power to impact the person because you see it every day. Our job is to give them that inspiration. To find out more about the mural, head to DetroitPerforms.org. Now let's check out what Credit Card Detroit has been up to as they share with us another citizen review. Hi, my name is Sally Jane Kirshen Shepherd, and I'm here at a staged reading uh, at Magenta Giraffe Theatre Company. And I'm really glad that they offer these readings. Playwrights need an opportunity to hear their work read out loud. And Magenta Giraffe is providing a place for playwrights to hear their work and audiences to provide feedback. And it's great for the playwrights, it's great for the actors, it's great for the community. So I'm really glad that they are offering this. And we just listened to a new play by Andrew Morton, set in Flint, Michigan. And it was uh, a really interesting and sweet play about these family relationships in this, you know, tough neighborhood, and um, I enjoyed it. You can view more of Credit Card Detroit Citizen Reviews on their Facebook page and YouTube channel, which you can find through DetroitPerforms.org. Now let's take a look at some upcoming arts events happening in Detroit. And now, here's a look at some of the arts events happening this week in our community.
I am here at Salt and Cedar, a letterpress studio in the heart of Eastern Market. Letterpress printing is their focal point, but they also have a fresh take on their art. Here is Salt and Cedar. Salt and Cedar is a letterpress studio in the heart of Detroit's Eastern Market. I've been an artist for over 20 years, and I've lived on either coast for all of my adult life. I moved to Detroit two years ago, and I was drawn to Eastern Market because it really is a site of commerce and activity. In addition to producing work on the letterpress, the space serves as a gallery. It's a creative and intellectual hub uh, within the city, and I feel it really, it really fills a void because people are drawn here to share experiences and thoughts and to narrate what it is to live in this time, in this place. Letterpress is a printing technology that's been around since the mid-15th century. It involves printing from a raised wood or metal form. The paper travels over the form on a tympan, and so uh, the paper picks up impression, and that tactility differentiates letterpress from any other kinds of printing. When we create custom jobs for clients, we don't leave anything to default. We choose papers and inks very carefully, so this kind of uh, careful attention to inking is, is again one of the qualities that sets letterpress apart from any other printing technologies. This is essentially a family-run operation. My partner and husband, Leon Johnson, has a project that falls under the rubric of the press. It's called Market Studio Kitchen. We work with Detroit youth on reclaiming the pleasure of table. We have some of the best produce in the world, we have some of the neediest communities in the country, and we're hoping to build a bridge between the market, our kitchen, and mom's table. I work with one student at a time, one family, one community. We meet eight o'clock on a Saturday morning, we walk the glorious market, we identify what's fresh, and uh, we buy two sets of what looks good. We go back to our kitchen, we work out a menu, we cook it, we eat it, we test it, we recook it if necessary. And then the student takes the second uh, set of ingredients home and prepares that meal that night for their family. So we're looking for that kind of rapid application, life-shifting experiences, pleasure-driven. Uh, the Book and Bread event happens once a month. It entails uh, us going into the market and sourcing out the freshest possible ingredients. And we're really lucky to have access to such a plethora of beautiful, fresh foods and wonderful, um, clean meats. We know our farmers. We know who grows the pork we're buying. Uh, we know who's roasting our coffee beans. We have a relationship with the wine cellar. Uh, and so it's, a, it's all about personal relationships. When we go into the market uh, to, to gather things for the, the very special meals we hold in the back of the press. Uh, the way that these evenings are run involves uh, having everybody mingle a little bit, sit at the table. Uh, everybody is fed a three-course meal, and then we make books together. Uh, everybody learns how to hand-stitch a monastery style journal and add a cover and by the end of the night uh, the participants walk away feeling like the structure of the book is demystified and that they have something, uh, they have a tool that they can work with, they have a place where they can reflect and so stories continue to flow through the pages. The thing that we're really compelled by is that this space serves as a place for people to gather and again share ideas we are bringing light and focus to many of the initiatives in the city of Detroit and we believe that the press is the perfect vehicle for dispatching those narratives. To find out more about Salt and Cedar as well as all the other artists featured in today's show, head to DetroitPerform.org. Shimmy Shack is cooking right here in Eastern Market. So the question is, is food art?
Ever since Japanese-inspired restaurant Uchi first opened in Austin and now in Houston, it would seem that it is. I went to school in Austin, got a job as a dishwasher at a Japanese restaurant, fell in love with sushi and the food. When I was watching them make the sushi, I was like, it seemed like it was sculpting, you know? But yet, you got to do it in front of people. And lastly, it was food and they ate it. So the two things together were just, I was like, wow, that's, what a job. The cool thing is, with food, as opposed to painting or sculpting or drawing, you get a lot more chances. Every night we'll do, how many plays do we do? We do hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And so you always get to improve new ideas, new visions, uh, you get to be more creative, and you have lots of opinions, and just, it has more of a, a life to it, as opposed to if you, if I painted something right now and put it on the wall, it's there, it's done. What kind of plate? Um, square plate. All four sides? Okay, don't go too long. All creativity to me comes from organization. You know, true creativity, you have to have some sort of structure. And so we say, what's the starting point? Are we starting with the color? Are we starting with the ingredient? And are you going to play off the texture? Are you going to play off the acidity? Are you going to play off of, of the flavor? Where is it going to go from the starting point? The thing about Japanese is everything is based on an asymmetrical sensitivity, you know, to where it's like things aren't black and white, things aren't, you know, here's the middle and, and here's the top. Everything comes together symmetrically from a different direction. You know, my food, I'm trying to get to jump off the plate, and the presentation is very important, but it's all about the color and uh, the vibrancy of it. So it's all relative. I always lean more towards a monochromatic setting. You have to limit the amount of colors you use on a plate because at a certain point it gets to where it's too much. If you're getting dressed and you if you picked out your favorite shirt, shoes, pants, socks, whatever, you probably wouldn't wear them all together. You'd want that one piece to pop when you wear it with the other things, right? That's what food is. Food is, is in the forefront of the performance but it's also relative to how it translates from the server and from the sushi chefs and just how it's all integrated. And the juxtaposition of the dishes, you know. If I give you 10 courses, they should all relate to each other. Go from hot to cold or heavy to light, back and forth, that kind of thing. It's almost like foreplay. <laughs> when things are light and clean and have that brightness to them, not heavy, the opposite of comfort food, you can try more things. You can eat more food, so instead of eating one or two plates, you can eat eight, 10, 15 plates. Try all these different things and share them. That's what we do at Uchi, is it's shareable food. It's chopstick friendly. It becomes an experience, as opposed to a couple dishes we went out to dinner. You know, that's not what we do. When I started, when I was in my early 20s, Nobody I knew knew sushi or ate sushi or went out to eat sushi, but nowadays pretty much everybody's tried sushi. And the cool thing is, is that eventually, once they've fallen in love with it, it's something that they crave. People really do crave sushi. They'll try to find the best place, and that's when they come to Uchi. To find out more about Uchi, head to DetroitPerforms.org. And that wraps it up for this edition of Detroit Performs. For more arts and culture, head to DetroitPerforms.org, where you'll find featured videos, blogs, and information on upcoming arts events. Don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. I'd like to thank the Eastern Market for all the fun we had here today and last week. This has been so much fun, you guys, and the food is amazing. In fact, I'm going to grab some. Until next time. Get out there and show the world how Detroit performs, y'all. I am DJ Oliver. Thanks for watching, guys. Major funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the McGregor Fund, 
Additional funding is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.